We often talk about being a follower of Jesus. We use that phrase an awful lot. What type of commitment is that? To what can we compare it? Well, one analogy comes easily enough to my mind, at least this, these days. It's like deciding to become a parent. My wife, Nicole, and I are in the midst of that process right now. Just over six months ago, Nicole became pregnant. At that point, there was no turning back. As the saying goes, there's no such thing as being a little bit pregnant. Thus, our journey, which is nearing its completion, began. Now, there are still plenty of other things in our lives that we are doing now and will be doing in the future. But this commitment takes precedence. This fork in the road will influence all the subsequent ones. As Jesus will explain in our text today from Luke's Gospel, there's no such thing as being a little bit of a servant of the kingdom of God. Begin with me in Luke chapter 9, verse 51. It says this, As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. The first phrase, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven. We looked at 1 Peter 3.15 last week. We talked about being prepared to share the gospel with people who ask us because we have a personal relationship with them. As we return now to the Gospel of Luke, picking up where we left off last August, if you remember that far back, in August we switched to Second Chronicles. Now I'm coming back to the Gospel of Luke. So throughout this passage, keep in the back of your mind that from here until chapter 19, Jesus is traveling toward his reunion with his Heavenly Father. We know, and Jesus knew, what lay between his current ministry to the people and his reunion. The road would not be easy, and it would, be, it would cost him everything in the end, including his life. But it was to walk this path that he had come into this world and taken humanity upon himself. Our own worries, our apprehensions about witnessing pale in comparison to what Jesus had to do in order for there to be any good news for us to share. We have been given the far easier task. Jesus took upon himself the suffering and the self-sacrifice. Jesus knew what lay beyond the suffering and death that was headed his way. His hope was firmly placed in the love and faithfulness of the Father. Pain was coming soon. But glory awaited beyond it. With, with resolution and determination, Jesus would be there soon. We're told that he resolutely set out for Jerusalem. His mind was made up. His choice was clear. In Jerusalem, the showdown between good and evil would come to its climax. And good would triumph by letting evil think that it had won. Each step closer to Jerusalem, each day closer to Passover, brought that test closer. Knowing the cost, knowing the goal, Jesus walked toward the task at hand. Now, we have just concluded our Christmas celebration. Our period of repentance and prayer during Lent will begin in five weeks. Therefore, let us utilize this time, this period between the two, as we read of Jesus' journey toward Jerusalem, to move forward with our own commitment to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is our goal. This is the goal that I hope that each of us can have as we move forward. The goal of having someone with you already that you have a connection with, someone with whom you already have a pre-existing relationship. Having that person here with us on Easter to celebrate the resurrection. That's the goal that I hope that each of us can take up and strive toward. And I'll talk about that more after the message. Verses 52 through 56. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? 
But Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they went to another village. He sent messengers on ahead to prepare for him. The route from Galilee to Jerusalem goes through Samaria, a region that had formerly been the, the ten northern tribes of Israel, a place that was populated with a people of mixed ethnicity who combined a worship of the God of Abraham with other religious practices as well. This situation has been, had been going on for 700 years, because 700 years prior to this, the Assyrian Empire had destroyed the Kingdom of Israel. It was ancient history, but it still impacted people in Jesus' day. Jesus, along with many Jews from Galilee, had traveled through Samaria to go to Jerusalem and then back home for the festivals many times. Making stops along the way is completely normal. There's nothing out of the ordinary about what's going on here. But the people there didn't welcome him because he was heading to Jerusalem. The primary religious disagreement between the Jews and the Samaritans here in the first century involves where worship should take place. The Jews worshiped, of course, at the temple in Jerusalem, rebuilt by Herod on the site of Solomon's temple. The Samaritans worshipped on Mount Gerizim, where they had built their own temple during the days of Nehemiah. The Jews and the Samaritans had much in common. They had a common ancestry and history and religion, but I think that only made their differences all the more bitter. If all of this conflict, though, was old news, and Jesus had been well received among the Samaritans up until this point, what has changed? Now, our text doesn't tell us, so we have to speculate a little bit. Before, Jesus was just another Jewish pilgrim, one among many. But now, he is a famous miracle worker and teacher, a prophet who had publicly clashed with the priestly leadership in Jerusalem. And yet, he still insists on going back there to Jerusalem to worship. Perhaps the Samaritans had hoped that he would reject Jerusalem because of the corruption of its leadership, maybe even join their side of the debate and, and endorse Mount Gerizim as an alternative. If that was the true motive or not, I'm not sure. Jesus was denied hospitality by this particular village on this particular occasion. James and John pipe in and say, hey, do you want us to uh, call down fire and destroy the place? There's a lot of Elijah imagery in this passage, if you think about it. It was only a few verses ago, back in 28 to 36, we studied that in the summer, of this same chapter that Luke wrote about the transfiguration, during which Elijah spoke to Jesus. James and John were witnesses of that interaction. Now they're suggesting to Jesus that he follow Elijah's example and call down fire from heaven. Elijah did it on a couple of occasions. There's one problem with this suggestion right off the bat, however. The situations aren't even remotely similar. Elijah's actions were in response to an armed group of soldiers sent by a corrupt king to arrest him. That was why he resorted to that tactic. He was speaking the truth and the king wanted him silenced. It's not quite the same thing as a group of men, women, and children who are simply being rude and not showing hospitality. They're not even close. Well, will Jesus respond to that suggestion with wrath or with mercy? We're told that Jesus turned and rebuked them and then simply went to another village. Far from considering their suggestion, Jesus responds to James and John by rebuking them for their desire to kill in order to defend his honor. As I was writing this message this week, events in the outside world certainly illustrated this point for me. This past Wednesday, 12 people were murdered by gunmen in Paris because they published cartoons that mocked Muhammad. That magazine, Charlie Hedbo, was known for its willingness to make fun of Christians and Jews and Muslims. The terrorists who responded to that quote-unquote provocation by seeking bloodshed 
are not that far removed from the zeal in the hearts here of James and John. It's not that different. To follow Jesus Christ, however, is not to become someone who hates those who reject him. We must follow him. But for those who refuse to join us, we feel only pity, knowing that they remain lost, not anger. Hopefully the very idea of actually wanting to kill people who reject or mock Jesus is repugnant enough in your mind that it has little appeal. But as Jesus reminds us, those who hate in their hearts have already committed murder in the eyes of God. I've witnessed a lot of hostility on the part of some Christians uh, throughout my life in different places and different times toward people and organizations and institutions that they think are opposing the gospel or against Christianity. I've seen it, I've heard it, I've read about it. That anger is unacceptable for a people whose God has declared, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. And who also said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. The anger that some Christians express towards, towards the government or the news media or various entertainers or whoever that happens to be, thinking that it's a grand conspiracy against our faith, that they're trying to destroy Christianity, that anger has to stop. Our only acceptable, God-honoring response, even to having our faith, our church, our God mocked or mistreated, is love. Because it is the response that our Savior gave to those who persecuted Him. Verses 57 to 62. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. These last six verses contain three unexpected responses by Jesus to people who expressed interest in following him. The responses are unexpected because most people who are trying to get people to volunteer to join in something would do so by highlighting the benefits of being part of that endeavor. If you were trying to get people to help you out with something, you're going to explain the good parts, not the bad. But Jesus' sales pitch to new recruits is to point out to them the high cost of following him. The first volunteer makes a sweeping statement of devotion. I will follow you wherever you go. Reminds me of Peter's promise at the Last Supper that I will follow you even to death, Peter says. From this volunteer, I think that wherever you go is a serious offer. He is trying to be sincere and show his devotion. Jesus responds by talking about foxes and birds. That response seems odd at first. But it serves as a warning that following him will not be easy. For Jesus, geography is not the primary element of following him. It's not about following you wherever you go. It is far less about where we follow than how we follow. To follow Jesus is to accept the possibility that the cost will be very high. The path of righteousness is not a path of luxury. It is not a path of ease. It is a path of self-control, devotion, and self-sacrifice. So to truly be a follower of Jesus Christ, we must be willing to place service above comfort, knowing that the cost of serving the kingdom of God, at least in material terms, will be high. 
The next man, when Jesus asks him to follow him, says back, let me first go and bury my father. We make it very clear here at this church that a man of God must first be a good son, a good husband, and a good father. The same obligation to family falls upon the women of this church as well. First be a good daughter, a good wife, a good mother. Family is a high priority, and rightly so. It should be. The second person that Jesus talked to about following him was willing to follow, but he had a serious family obligation to attend to first. Jesus responded to him by saying, let the dead bury their own. You go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Jesus' response at first glance makes little sense to us, because our obligation to provide a proper burial for our Father is not something unusual. It's perfectly understandable. It's a very reasonable request. But in the context of his own resolute journey toward Jerusalem, which we just read about, as well as the other two people uh, contemplating following, following Jesus that are before this example and after this example, the focus of Jesus' response is this. I think this is what he is trying to say. There will always be important, even good reasons and things that will keep you from beginning to do what you know God wants you to do. If you wait for the quote-unquote right time to start serving the kingdom of God, life will always give you a reason for delay. Jesus uses this extreme example of a man being told to follow before he even has a chance to bury his father. And that's a very poignant example, because that moment in our life is one of the most meaningful we will ever live through. The death of our parents is memorable as the birth of a child. It sticks with us. Jesus picks that kind of example in order to illustrate that now is the time to begin to serve. Not tomorrow, not next month, now. Now we can, of course, fulfill our family obligations and serve the kingdom of God, and that is what we should do. To serve God but neglect your family is not a choice that honors God. Yet we must begin to do both and not allow ourselves to believe that being a servant of God can wait until a more opportune time, because it might never come, and we may never get around to it. It's not acceptable. The third man says, I will follow you, but first let me go back and say goodbye. Once again, a perfectly reasonable request, and one that echoes the words of Elisha that we read earlier, when Elijah appointed him to be Israel's next prophet. In that case, Elijah granted the request, and Elisha took the oxen that he was plowing with when Elijah arrived. He sacrificed them. He had a last meal, a feast with his family, and then he followed Elijah. So it's a perfectly reasonable request. Jesus responds with this. No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Jesus utilizes the same imagery of Elisha plowing with his oxen in the field to explain in his response the absolute dedication and commitment that it takes to follow in his footsteps. The metaphor itself is simple enough for us to grasp. Anyone who looks back over his, his or her shoulder while plowing a field with a draft animal will end up with crooked furrows plowing into that field. And that's not acceptable. You can't plow a field crookedly. It won't work. Similarly, for those who choose to follow Jesus Christ, looking back over your shoulder at missed opportunities for yourself, at temptations that you turn down for his sake and say, oh, I really wanted to do that, though. That is not the way to be an effective servant of God. It doesn't work that way. We need to look ahead. When Jesus set out for Jerusalem, he knew exactly what awaited him there. He went anyway. There was no illusion about the time of trial and ultimately death that lay ahead. He knew it was there. But there was also certainty of faith that beyond that act of dedication and commitment to his Father's plan lay the redemption of lost humanity and his own glorious reunion with his Father. Why was Jesus harsh then on those who kind of, sort of, wanted to follow him? 
because we cannot sit on the fence and do the kingdom of God any good. 1 Peter 3.15 last week showed us that we need to prepare our hearts by recognizing that Christ is Lord and prepare our minds by understanding what our faith is and what it has done for us. Today, Jesus' words in Luke remind us that our time here on Sunday morning is no game. It is not a hobby. It is not an interest. It's not even a club. We have come here into the house of God and gathered in the name of Jesus Christ because we too must set out resolutely toward our goal. We all have the same goal. That when our days here on earth are over and we join our Father in that reunion, that what we will hear is this. Well done, my good and faithful servant. That is our goal. Our path to it requires our commitment and dedication to the work of the kingdom of God. For we are the servants of the King of Kings.